All right, so briefly want to discuss some of Earth's geological activity. Um, and this we will be able to use as a basis for looking at geological activity on other planets. So this idea all comes down to that idea of convection. So like I said before, um, convection is a, basically a process of heat transfer. And the uh, um, example you're most familiar with is boiling a pot of water, where heat um, near the bottom of the pot is transferred to the water. And then that hot material rises. It cools at the top where it's losing heat to the air and then sinks, uh, that cooler material then sinks, and then that cycle repeats, right? And so this process of convection is a process of moving heat by moving material in a fluid. And this uh, is important not only to generating the magnetic field like we just saw, but also to geological activity and also weather. So this idea of convection is linked to all of those. So you can really think of the earth as just a system for uh, redistributing heat and energy. And that's what's driving most of the processes that we notice. So convection is connected to plate tectonics because um, essentially what we have on Earth are separate tectonic plates and they are essentially carried on top of these convective cells that get set up in the Earth's mantle. And so you can imagine if you have a pot of boiling water and you drop like, I don't know, one of those little shell noodles or a macaroni maybe, then it, you'll see it moving in a way that will tell you about the organization of the convective cells in the pot of water underneath it. Okay, so our tectonic plates are like the macaroni, but maybe it's better to say, I don't know, lasagna sheets floating around the top, um, carried around by these convective cells. So here's an image of all the plates on the earth. The plate boundaries are denoted by uh, black and blue lines here. And the ring of fire uh, around the Pacific plate is outlined here in red. All those little red triangles are volcanoes. So here's our friends, the Cascade volcanoes. And you'll notice that they basically line up along the uh, outside of these plate boundaries. This is a particularly active set of plate boundaries um, because of the nature of what these plates are doing as they interact with each other. So there's many ways that the plates can interact. I'll show you a few examples. Um, you'll also notice that there's some volcanoes that are not at a plate boundary, and these are caused by a different, um, a different process than plate tectonics. All right, so we have all of these plates. So how are they interacting with each other and what kinds of geological activity results from those interactions? Um, the two that your book um, pulls out as being the most important are rifts and subduction zones. So a rift is anywhere where two plates are pulling apart from each other. Uh, this can occur in the ocean in which it's called seafloor spreading. And the seafloor spreading, the, the new land that's generated by that, is um, it's a really good way to figure out what Earth's magnetic field was like in the past uh, because the, as the rock is um, you know, generated, it's molten, and any little bits of um, magnetic material in that rock can line up with the Earth's magnetic field. And so we can actually go and look at the rocks from sub um, subfloor spreading areas and see the patterns uh, of the magnetic field and how it's flipped its north and south pole over time. So that's pretty cool. And uh, it tells us that based on the frequency that the, the magnetic field flips, we're kind of overdue for a flip and it could happen anytime. Okay, so that's rifts. Rifts can also occur um, on continents and there's uh, one in particular in Africa um, that is very large. And other than that, they're mostly in the ocean, but you know, probably simply because most of Earth's surface is covered in ocean. All right, the other type of plate boundary that's really important is called subduction. And that's when one plate basically gets, uh, well, subducted, pressed underneath another plate. And so the plate going underneath is eventually, you know, recycled into the rock of the mantle. And this can also cause um, some um, mountain formation, volcanic activity, et cetera. Okay, the last type of activity that's not uh, connected to rifts or subduction, but still connected to what I would call volcanism is hotspots. So a hotspot is basically when you have some sort of um, plume of material that rises from the mantle 
um, higher, um, so it's like an upwelling region, I guess I would say, of molten material. And as the as a plate moves over that hot spot, uh, little volcanoes will be generated um, as that hot spot kind of sends up new plumes. So the Hawaiian Islands are a really good example of some land generated by a hot spot. So as the plate moves along the surface, um, the hot spot stays in the same place, but you'll get the chain of islands being generated as it pushes up through the plate moving over it. Okay, so the different plate boundaries generate different uh, geological features. And so here's an example of a subduction zone from an oceanic plate uh, subducting under a continental plate. And this particular type of subduction zone is really familiar because this is the one that has produced all of the Cascade volcanoes. So here's Mount Jefferson, one of my favorite Cascade volcanoes. Um, and this um, you know, plate boundary also builds a lot of tension. So right now this, um, what we call the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting underneath the uh, Pacific Continental Plate. I don't know if that's the name of that plate, but the, the subduction zone is called the Juan de Fuca zone. And it's basically kind of like, if you have two materials that you're trying to uh, slide past each other, but they're locked up because of friction, then they build more and more tension. And then when they finally do slip, it's gonna be a really violent event. So you've probably heard of the, you know, the big one, the large earthquake that's projected to happen at some point uh, because of this uh, subduction zone. So these boundaries are really consequential, not just for these mountain building, you know, volcanoes, but also because of the uh, potential earthquakes that they can generate. Okay, another one that you're probably familiar with is a strike slip fault. This is where two plates uh, rub against each other like this. So uh, this is the San Andreas fault in California. And it's a, you know, one of the, the most local examples of a strike slip fault. So again, not generating new land per se, but generating a lot of earthquake activity. Okay, and then one of my favorites is continental subduction, uh, which can generate mountains as it sort of buckles and folds the land um, from the plate that's going up, right? And a good example of a continental subduction zone is the Rocky Mountains. I'm from Colorado, so this image of the Front Range Mountains is something that I'm quite familiar with. That's why it's one of my favorites. All right, so that's just a few examples. There's lots of other ways that plates can move and they all make different um, types of features. And in general, when the mountains are made, they're not in the shapes that they are now. Uh, the process of erosion is kind of the counterpart to our geological activity, right? The process of erosion uh, wears away the rock after it's formed by wind, water, and ice. So this is kind of the way that we complete the entire um, cycle of geological activity. Okay, so just to sum up these first few sections, which of these following would be good evidence that the Earth's interior is not rigid? So plate tectonics are good evidence that the Earth's interior is not rigid, right? Because there has to be some motion in order to set up those convective cells that the plates can be carried on top of. So that's not gonna happen if the planet is completely a rigid solid body. And then the existence of the magnetic field is also good evidence because we need some sort of um, metallic material in motion in order to generate that magnetic field. And so the liquid outer core is not rigid, it's fluid. And that's what's generating our field. <laughs> 